Thank you, Cass. Thank you very much. Hello, church. Now, I love the Bible. I love it. But I only started loving the Bible when I actually delved into it. You've got to understand it to love it. If you don't understand it, it's very hard to love it. Um, and so today we are delving into the story of Joseph. Okay? Now, the Joseph story is famous. If you've been around church long enough, you've heard this story enough times. But as I prepared this message, I learned so much. I, I saw things. I, 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 God spoke to me. And so I pray, don't switch off because you know the story. There are some things here that you need to know. Okay, so let's get straight into it. Genesis 37. If you've got your Bibles, have them out. We're going through heaps of the scripture today. Um, so have them out. If you've got your phone, have it out. Um, but we've got it on the screen. So Genesis 37, 1 to 4, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. Now last week, Cass talked to us about Jacob and his wives, Leah and Rachel, and it was a mess, it was a big controversy, but God used that circumstance. Um, but there were consequences, there are always consequences, good or bad, from our actions, from our words and from our attitudes, and we see these consequences played out in the story of Joseph. So, this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending to the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zippah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born in uh, to him in his old age. Now, Israel is another name for Jacob. Just so you're aware, there's a, he had two names, really. Israel was given to him later in his life. Um, and so he loves Joseph more than all the other sons. And for us to understand why this is the case, to truly understand, we've got to delve in deeper. We've got to understand this family structure, what's happening in this family. What, what happened after Jacob had uh, children with four different women. Things happened, and we gotta, we got to work that out. So I've got a family tree here so we can kind of visualise what's happening here. So we've got Abraham and Sarah. This is the family of Israel, okay? This is God's family. This is where it all began with Abraham. We are children of Abraham in this room today. Um, it all standard, started with Abraham. He, they had, he, um, Abraham and Sarah had a son called Isaac, Isaac and Rebekah had a son called Jacob, and Jacob was really busy because he had four women and he had 12 sons and one daughter. Um, and you can see that. So each of those sons has a number. We had starts with Reuben as number one, all the way to Benjamin, number 12. Uh, and you can see the different um, women he had the children with. And so Leah, the older sister, had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Um, and Rachel, near the end, had Joseph and Benjamin. And so who was here last week with Cass? Beautiful, stacks of you. We saw that Jacob really, really wanted to marry Rachel all along. But unfortunately, because he was deceived by the father-in-law, he ended up marrying Leah too and had children with Leah. But we've got to understand, Joseph... You can see he is number 11, but he's the first son of Rachel, the one he loved, his favourite. Now, unfortunately, Jacob has favourites. He had favourite wives. He had favourite sons. And it's this favouritism that corrupted this family and in the end caused this conflict, this bitterness this murderous hate that in the end the brothers had for Joseph. So we've got to understand this family to understand what's happening here, um, which, is, um, which is very important. So Joseph found himself in a situation whereby he was born into this unconditional love, but this love caused his brothers to burn with anger because they were jealous. They all craved their father's love too. That's why. That's why they didn't like him. Now, Joseph did not have any control over his father's attitude and actions. He was born into this position. 
However, he did have a choice in how to respond. No matter what your situation um, right now in this room, you do have control over your actions, over your words, and over your attitudes. Unfortunately, at the beginning of this story, Joseph, he bec- and we can understand this now, he's this favourite, he grows up with a superiority complex. He, because of this, he kind of, he reacts to his brothers and he almost responds to them because he knows he's the best. He knows he's the most loved. He's, he knows he's the most favourite. And so he has this complex. And so you see it back in that verse we just um, read earlier. Um, in the red here, that he's out in the fields with his brothers, his older brothers. He's only 17 and he has the confidence to go back to his father and give a bad report about his brothers. Now, this isn't going to help, is it? They already don't like him, and now he gives a bad report. At school, I'm a teacher. We try to make it, we try to distinguish between dobbing and reporting. Now, <laughs> dobbing, we say to the, the students, dobbing is trying to get someone in trouble. Reporting is trying to get someone out of a trouble. If things are going down, we need students to actually report it. So often students are in the worst circumstances and the teachers don't know because they don't want to dob. But reporting is trying to get someone out of trouble, yourself or your friends or someone like that. But dobbing is just trying to get someone into trouble. And in my opinion, Joseph is dobbing on his brothers here. He didn't need to do it. Now, we don't know the circumstance. Maybe he is actually in, in the right here, but he didn't need to give this report about um, his brothers. It didn't really help. For the brothers, this was strike one. And it only gets worse for Joseph in this situation because next, in verse three to four, Jacob decides to create this ornate, this colourful robe to give to Joseph, his favourite son. And when the brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and they could not speak a kind word to them. This robe was a robe that kings would give to their daughters. This robe shouldn't have really gone to Joseph. If he was number 11, if really, if anyone should have got it, it should have, been got, it should have been given to Reuben, number one. But really, it should have been given, we didn't talk about her, it should have been given to Dilhar, the sister. But Joseph gets it instead. It's a type of robe you shouldn't really be wearing around all the time, but he wears it around all the time. And his brothers sees him in it all the time. It would frustrate the heck out of them. And for them, the brothers, this was strike two. It only gets worse. In verse five, Joseph has a dream. Joseph dreams. And usually these dreams are given by God. They're good dreams. But at this point, he gets this dream and he really should just keep it to himself at this moment. But he, has the, he decides to share it with the brothers. Um, so let's read it. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? They hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were all bowing down to me. All of those things were the brothers and the family. He had these two dreams and he, ha- he thought it was a good idea to tell his family. It wasn't a good idea. It wasn't a good idea. Uh, Joseph receives a God-given dream, but he thought it was a good idea to go straight to his older brothers to let them know. Not just once, but twice. Joseph's attitude was wrong in this situation. His dream was correct, but his attitude caused further conflict with his brothers. Even his dad rebuked him. After the second dream, his dad rebuked him. 
And this was strike three for the brothers. They got to the point where they could not get over their hate, their bitterness, their jealousy, and it got to the point that they wanted to murder him. Let's have a read of this next section. So what happened is the brothers are off in a distant land um, or just a couple of days away um, farming. And And Jacob sends Joseph to go see how they're going. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into the the cisterns to say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. They were done with this boy, and they wanted to get rid of him. And what there was no, there's no excuse. This is evil. This is sin. But we can kind of understand why, where they're at. Okay, um, we can kind of understand why they're sick of this, um, this, their youngest brother, the spoiled brat. Um, and so at this point in the story, he could have been killed. That could have been it. But Reuben, the firstborn, if we remember the family tree, Reuben, the firstborn, actually tries to save him. If you can, you can read up on the screen. He actually tried to save them. Um, but, uh, but I wonder, because he doesn't really, he kind of just says, let's not kill him, let's just chuck him into this well and just leave him there. I wonder, could have Reuben just rebuked his brothers and said, no, he's the oldest. He could have said, no, he's our blood, we're not going to kill him, it's not right. But he didn't. And I think he didn't, is if we understand the story, Reuben, back a couple of chapters, when Rachel, the most loved wife, if we remember Rachel, the, Rachel, the, when she died, Reuben had the audacity to sleep with her maidservant. And that made Jacob furious because it wasn't in his right to do. Um, and so Reuben, at this point, is not in a good position in his family. He can't really rebuke his brothers because he's as disrespected as really Joseph is. It's just in a different way. So he couldn't do it. Um, So what happens is Joseph comes along. If we look at the next passage, um, what happens is they grab Joseph, they strip him of this colourful robe, and they chuck him in a well. And we've got to ask here, why is Joseph wearing this robe anyway? He's, on this, he's gone for a few days. He's walking through the fields. He's wearing his best robe. He, wants, he just wants his brothers to know, look at me. Look at what my dad gave me. My dad, not your dad, my dad. Um, and so this is it. They strip him of it. They chuck him in the well. And Joseph just keeps getting himself more in trouble with his brothers because of his poor choices. It wasn't his fault that his father loved and favoured him more, but it was his fault in how he responded. There was something prideful in Joseph's attitude, which made the situation worse. So often, and this is my big point today, I'm going to come back to it a few times. So often, our choices have more influence than our current situation in determining our future destination. At this point in time, he's dead. He's de- because of his choices, he's dead. He should have been dead. Charles Swindle says it even better. Check this out. Life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. If you've got to write something down, write that down. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% on how we react to it. We can't choose our position sometimes. We can't choose our family sometimes. Sometimes we are in a job that we are a bit stuck in at the time. But during these times, we can choose how we respond. We can choose our words. We can choose our attitudes. We can choose our actions. We do have a choice in life. Now, in verse 26, Judah, the fourth son of Leah steps up. Now we heard last week that Judah is actually the line of King David and Jesus. He's a really important fellow. 
next chapter, I wish we could go into it, he's actually also a really dodgy fellow um, in, in chapter 38. But at this moment, Judah steps up and he actually steps up and saves Joseph's life. He convinces his brothers to sell Joseph into slavery instead of killing him. So Judah saves Joseph's life, and thank goodness for that. And it actually saves Judah's life. If we know the story, if Joseph died at this moment, the whole family would be gone um, in about 20 years or 15, 20 years. The whole family, the Old Testament done if Joseph died at this moment. So Judah, thank goodness, he steps up. Uh, so in verse 31, what happens is um, Joseph is sent away in um, slavery, sold off. Jacob um, convinces um, the brothers to sell him off to slavery and they take that colourful robe that they would want to rip up. They'd be so sick of seeing it all the time and they dip it in this goat's blood and they go to the father. I can't believe they actually did it. They go to the father and say, look, dad, he died. An animal got him. He's been all torn up and everything. You can see all the blood. And Jacob sees this robe. This is his most favourite most beloved son, and it shouldn't have been like that, but it was, he sees this robe and, and Jacob is ruined. He's, he kind of tears his clothes, clothes he's ruined um, because he thinks his most beloved son is dead. Um, and so that's um, where we leave that part of the story. So if you've got your Bibles, you can see that there is a chapter, chapter 38, the story actually moves into Judah for a while, and I really encourage you, read that when you get home. Check out what Judah ends up doing. He, he has his moment of glory, and that probably is where he peaked in his life, because it only goes down. He's one of the most dodgy fellows in Genesis. Um, now, so in chapter 39, it picks up, it goes back to Joseph. And Joseph was sold into slavery and ended up becoming a slave to an Egyptian official, Potiphar. So there must have been something that happened during this time. There must have been. Joseph must have been going through this immense suffering. He must have been humbled. His family betrayed him. He was disconnected from his loving father. He was totally alone. He had no idea where he was going to end up. He had, he had to, and this is the thing about suffering, he had to rely on God in this moment. More than any of his brothers had to. Probably more than his fathers had to. Joseph had to rely on God in this moment. That's all he had. He literally had nothing else. He was a slave. He went from probably a middle class most loved son to an Egyptian slave. There's a big contrast. He had nothing left. Sometimes in life, when we go through this suffering period, it's a terrible time, and God would never, ever want it for you, but he uses this suffering to mould you into something else. And it happened to me, and it happened to Joseph. Because you can see, um, I believe it was this suffering that made this young person, Joseph's only 17, this suffering he went through moulded Joseph into a great man of God. He was probably one of the greatest in Genesis. He's probably one of the greatest in the Bible. From this moment on, Joseph only points to God. He never points to himself. He used to point to himself. Now he's only pointing to God. And we see that. And the consequences of that were that not only that he was blessed, but the people around him was blessed. And it was this time of suffering. And we've so many of us in this room have been through it or maybe going through it. I went through it. I've been through it a couple of times. A couple of years ago, a lot of you know this story for me, is my brother was diagnosed with cancer and I had one year with him. We wanted more, we prayed for more, but I had one year with him. And during that immense time of suffering, I could have gone the other way. I could have just reacted. I could have, I blame, at the time I did blame God. 
At a time I was angry at God. Why wouldn't my brother get better? Other people get better. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed and he didn't get better. And this was a really shocking time. And some, some of you in this room have gone through this time. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. Some of you may be going through this time right now. It might not be death. It might be other things. But it's these, these times that shape and mould you. During that time, my relationship with God flourished to a point that I've never had it before. I, I, had, I had to have faith in God. I had to realise that it's only the resurrection of Christ that there's any hope in that situation of death. And that is why, and from that, I've held on to that, and I take that into wherever I go now. I'm a different person because of that suffering. Um, and so for you, this suffering you're going through right now, it, it shouldn't be the case. God doesn't want it, but he could be using it. Or the stuff that you've gone through, he can use it. Let him. Um, and so for Joseph... Everything changed. And you see it straight away, even the language of the Bible changes. In verse 2, let's have a read. In verse 2, what happens is it says God is with Joseph. During this time, he's a slave, but God is with Joseph. It's so obvious, it oozes off him that God is with him. He's got the Midas touch. Everything he touches just works out. And this becomes so obvious that his master, Potiphar, keeps promoting him up and up and up, and he ends up being the, the top dog. He ends up being the guy who runs basically the whole show, and Potiphar is really just this, he obviously owns everything, but, but uh, Joseph is the manager of everything. He trusts him that much, and because Potiphar trusts Joseph, the, the whole family prospers and gets better and better. What happens in the story is when Joseph prospers, when people trusted him, they prosper too. Um, the blessing that J uh, Joseph had wasn't just for Joseph, it was for other people. That's what the whole point of blessing is. Um, so what happens here is it seems like everything's going all right. Joseph's got himself into a good position. Uh, in verse 6, though, it all goes downhill really quickly because of Potiphar's wife. If we know the story, we understand that this is a really awkward situation. In verse 6, now Joseph was a well-built and handsome man. Now, the, Joseph's just one of these really annoying people who's just got everything. He's got the looks, he's got the intelligence, he's got, he's got a great body, he's probably really funny and witty, like he's just got everything. I've got a friend called Johnny and he's just got everything. He's just, um, he's great at sport, he's intelligent. When I was growing up with him, I was just like, man, this guy's so flipping annoying, he's good at everything. At least, I was, I'm a bit of a geek, at least I'm great at video games. That's like, literally, it's the only thing I... I play video games with him. He's better at video games than me too. He killed, like he beats me all the time. He's just one of these really annoying people. Joseph is one of these really annoying people. He's good at everything. And unfortunately, that can bring good attention from Potiphar and it can bring bad attention from Potiphar's wife. And that's what happened. Potiphar's wife wanted some action and she wanted it from Joseph. Um, and it wasn't very good. Joseph was being tempted, and it was a big temptation. This was sexual temptation, and Joseph's family, when you read Genesis, Joseph's family, this family I just showed you then, of Abraham all the way through, had a history to succumbing to sexual temptation. The chapter before, just before, chapter 38, describes a time when Joseph's brother, Judah, was not able to resist this temptation. We all have temptations in our life. And for some of us, it is sexual temptation. It's constant. It's always there. It's either in a person or it's in our phone or it's on the computer or it's on the TV. It's always there. For some of us, this temptation is that need to always be in control. You just have to be in control. It's that temptation. You know you don't have to, 
be in control. You know that God's in control, but it's that temptation to always have to run the show. For some of you, it could be um, your reputation. It could be that you just have to be, wherever you are, the smartest person in the room, and you've got to prove it. It could be that you have to be the prettiest person in the room or the richest person in the room. Many of these temptations run our lives, and if we're not careful, we can find ourselves consistently succumbing to what is continually tempting us. And Joseph has a choice. He could have an affair with his boss's wife, or he could refuse. Let's have a look at what happens in the next verse. He refused, thank goodness, because if the ramifications, if he followed the path of his brothers, would be horrendous. He refused, though, and get this, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted me to my care. No one is greater in this house than I. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? We've got to understand this language is so rare in Genesis. No one connects their actions to God in Genesis. They just do the actions, and the actions are not very good. Um, But Joseph, because of this, I think, because of the suffering he went through, his relationship with God was so strong that he started outworking things in his life and he, because he was always pointing to God. And this is one instance. He pointed to God. This would not only be bad for Potiphar. It wouldn't be ba- just be bad for me. It wouldn't be just bad for you, Potiphar's wife. It would be against God. Um, our actions have consequences. Um, so what we've got here is a temptation. And in Genesis, we've seen this exact temptation before. Adam and Eve were in the same situation. It just looked a little bit different. In in Genesis 2, it shows that God gave Adam and Eve everything. They had everything that they could possibly want or need, but they wanted more. And they were tempted for more. And in the end, they succumbed to that temptation. They failed. Joseph, who had the sinful nature because of Adam and Eve's sin, didn't fail. Us in this room have that same sinful nature. I have that same sinful nature. And Joseph can be an encouragement. Even if the temptation is just so shockingly strong, we can Uh, we don't have to succumb to it. We don't have to fail in this situation. So what happened in verse 11? One day, because this just kept happening, part of his wife didn't, his argument wasn't good enough. She just kept wanting to have sex with him. Um, It just kept happening. Um, And so one day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. He literally fled from temptation. He got out of there. He needed to get out of there. He knew if he didn't get out of there, he'd succumb. Because men, we we know what it is. If a woman's on us... We know it is temptation. He literally had to flee. He literally moved. Sometimes in life, the only option is to flee. If it is to actually get up and leave the room, to break free from temptation, it might mean you literally have to move. It might mean to get in the car and drive away. It might mean to chuck your phone aside. It might mean to turn that TV off or delete that app that just keeps giving you trouble. There's always that one app on your phone that keeps giving you trouble. Delete it. Sometimes you just have to delete it and then tell someone about it so you don't put it back on. Um, it's just what is the, the sometimes it happens. Sometimes you may have to quit your job. If this is your situation... If there's someone in your workplace that's constantly hounding you, constantly giving you those little signals that they want more, but but you know you can't, 
what's better, to ruin your marriage and keep your job or to get out of there and save your marriage? Sometimes you might have to quit your job. Sometimes you just have to leave that party. Sometimes you might have to leave that relationship. Sometimes you have to finish that friendship. And sometimes if you've got this, I've just had this thing in my mind, if you've been given money, if you, maybe it's an inheritance, there's this inheritance that you've got and it's causing this conflict in your own family because of this inheritance. Maybe it's best for your family to give that money away. Man, that's hard. But what's better, to be rich and have conflict in your family or to just not have it, you didn't need it, and to save your, your family? Maybe, I don't know if that's for anyone, but... We should never run away from challenge. I'm not saying when the going gets tough to quit, but I am saying when the temptation is too real, too often, too dangerous, just too tempting, Joseph had to leave, you may have to leave too. Unfortunately though, Joseph was in a lose-lose situation. He did the right thing, but the wrong thing still happened to him. Sometimes we do the right thing, but the wrong thing happens to us. Let's just check this last verse out. Um, this is Potiphar's wife. She keeps the cloak beside her until the master came home. Then she told him this made-up story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make a sport of me. What language? To make a sport of me. You don't hear that too often. Um, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the room. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master, Potiphar, took him, to, took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Joseph did everything right, but the wrong thing happened still. Now, the first time... He's, this is such an unfair situation. The first time he didn't do everything right, but he got, and he got sent to slavery. He had this amazing experience in suffering to the point that he now is a totally different person, to the point where he can now not do what his family keeps doing. He can actually refuse temptation. He, he, he doesn't succumb to temptation, and the same thing happens to him again he gets sent to prison. First he was sent to slavery, now he gets sent to prison. This is unfair. This is a really hopeless situation. And there's, really, there's nothing he could do in this situation. It, this time, it's totally out of his control. And sometimes in life, we are in these situations that are totally out of control. And we, there's nothing we can do about it. But thank goodness we have Christ because that's when we need him the most. Have you noticed that it was Joseph's clothes that kept on getting him in trouble? <laughs> First the colorful robe, and now this cloak. He did the right thing, but the one thing he probably did wrong is he should have pulled that cloak out of his hands and ran. But who would have thought? Um, but there's this repetition in this story, I wanted to make this point. I wish I had the spiritual analogy, the robe, the cloak, the spiritual analogy for you guys. I couldn't think of one. But there is a repetition to Joseph's story. The same thing keeps happening. He seems to find himself in the same situations um, and it happens over and over again. Joseph is often put in a lose-lose situation that actually affects his short to medium term circumstance. But the amazing thing about this story is that all of these things keep happening because God has the big long picture in mind. He's behind all this mess, weaving his, his, his plan so that um, Joseph, in the end, next week's gonna be an amazing message. Joseph, in all of this stuff, God uses Joseph to ultimately bring Joseph to a position of greatness 
Like right now he's in prison. You can't imagine him. Now he's going to be a position of greatness. He brings Joseph into a position of greatness, not for Joseph's sake, but for the sake of the nations. And that's the whole point of the family. The whole point of God's family is to be blessed so they could be a blessing. And Joseph outworks that. So often, our choices have more influence than our current situation in determining our future destination. What I want to ask you today is, what situation are you in at the moment? What choices can you make right now? Are you currently experiencing an unusual level of conflict in your life? There's always conflict, we know that. But in your family, with your spouse, at your workplace, with a friend, we all know relationships are two-way streets. Conflict is inevitable. However, are you getting in the way of potential restoration? Is there something that you are doing that is contributing to this conflict? Is your pride getting in the way? Joseph's pride got in the way. And that's why the conflict kept happening. Is there something in your control which you can restore that relationship in your mind right now because you're thinking about it? Is there a strong temptation in your life that you are constantly succumbing to? Or if you know yourself right now, you could be close to succumbing to it. What needs to change? Do you need to leave a situation? Do you need to seek support? Something actually has to change. The temptation is going to keep being there. It really just goes away by itself. Something actually has to change. You've got to do something. Don't think for one second that um, what you keep stumbling over is just going to disappear. We can pray that God will take that temptation away, but we still need to actively change something. And lastly, are you at this moment in a seemingly hopeless situation? Right at this moment in the story, Joseph is in a hopeless situation. But in the very next verse, it says that during that time, God is with him. He's present with Joseph. God in your situation right now, this hopeless situation, he's with you. But maybe you haven't acknowledged that presence for a long time. If you are stuck, Christ is here to pull you out. If you are broken, Christ is here to mend your heart. Whatever situation you are in, Christ can be your hope. It doesn't mean it will get better straight away, but he can be our source of hope in any hopeless situation. Let's pray. Let's get into an attitude of prayer. Thank you, Father, so much that you are the source of hope when, if without you, it would just be utter hopelessness. Thank you so much that in our conflict, in our families, in our marriage, at work, you have that way out. Thank you so much that in our temptation, thank you that you understand this temptation. And I thank you that you don't blame us for that temptation. But I, I thank you that you always give us a way out. And I pray for some people in this room right now. Show them that way out. Give them that wisdom. Give them that strength, that courage to get out of that situation. I thank you that ultimately, no matter where we're at, the hope that we have in you, because you died and rose again, this source, this resurrection power is in every single one of us. And thank you that we can cling to that power that you have given to us, that you have freely just 
given to us in grace. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we all stand? We're about to sing a song. And the songs today, well, how hope-filled were they? And we're going to sing the same songs again. But I just want to really just hone in on this. We've got time. I don't know where you're at. I don't know your situation. But the three things really came out in this message today. Conflict, temptation, hopelessness. Jesus is the answer to all three of those things. Thank goodness. And right here today, we have, this is why church is so awesome. We can offer these things. I can't help you in those situations, but we can offer this thing. Whatever's happening in your family at the moment, your extended family, there's this, this tension that's been running through it for decades. Bring it to God. Bring it to God. Is there something that you need to repent of because you've been the source of that conflict? Or are you just in this hopeless situation? Bring it to God. Or if, if you're here and you just this word temptation, you know it. You know what I'm talking about. It keeps bugging you. Bring it to God. Something has to change. The great thing about prayer is prayer is a source of change. We start taking our attention off us and prayer is putting our attention onto God. So come down the front. When we sing, come down the front. Let me pray for you. Let one of the pastors pray for you. This could be that first change that you need to do to get out of this mess. Or if you're just in that hopeless situation, I've been there. If there's, if there's sickness in your family, and you don't know what to do. There's sometimes there is nothing you can do. At least we can come to God. He is here. He is here. So come down and pray. If you are needing this, come down and pray. Let's sing.